Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We are joined by James Fladdick, who uh, has extensive experience in the sales ops world. I'm counting up to 20 years, but we'll get James to confirm that in a yes. second. Um, most recently at Software AG, Government Solutions, James has now gone his own way, but we'll also talk about that as well. James, welcome to the show. Yes, Verify, uh, just over 20 years. It's actually February of 29th of the year 2000, so a little bit over that. It's very easy to remember as being February 29th. So thank you. Uh, no worries. Glad to be here. Did you have a um, like a 20-year party on the 29th? Um, yes. <laughs> I thought about it. A 20-year party, yes. I think uh, every year in, in sales ops ages you a couple of years. I'm actually only 25 years old, so <laughs> but no. Amazing. Thank you, James. So first I want to understand, let's, let's take this back 20 years to understand when you actually, like how you got into sales operations. Um, my, my family owned a contracting business, a swimming pool contracting business, and it was near the end of, obviously, you know, it was around Y2K. Uh, I decided that it was really, you know, I had to make, I had to make a decision in my life as to what I wanted to do in the long run. I went back, got my, um, business degree, my MBA. I got into technology. I was never really that interested in the, the tech side, you know, the bits and bytes and things like that, and not so much even in finance, but it was more along the lines of the business and sales piece. So I became an analyst. I, was a, um, I worked for a company that did multiple um, acquisitions. So I would uh, do M&A work. I would do due diligence work, and that kind of morphed into pricing and deal desk, um, sales compensation, uh, revenue recognition data analytics, um, CRM, and things like that. And the next thing I knew, a couple of years later, I had about 40 people working for me doing various roles, including doing enterprise sales and renewals and things like that. So I've always been really, really interested and really kind of passionate about the business side of it, you know, the ops role, and really the, the cross-functional nature of it has always interested me and intrigued me. Got it. Awesome. And then just... Rewinding back to the last role at AG, mm -hmm. could you roughly outline the, the sales and RevOps tech stack that you guys were running? Um, really kind of basic stuff. Uh, I look at the BD things like outreach, um, Pardot. Uh, we used uh, tools such as, I, I like to think of a lot of the lead gen tools that we use, Discover Org. Uh, we used uh, FedBizOps, things like that. And we use, we use Salesforce.com. Uh, very, very judiciously. I, I like to say I'm a very much a pragmatist. I'm not, I'm not going to bombard you with overuse of technology. Um, we incorporated that with Funnel Source, which was our um, forecasting process or our forecasting app that laid on top of salesforce.com. And we used other things such as uh, contract management tools uh, called Spring CM. That was part of our approval process in Salesforce and kind of how we moved um, paper through the, through the system. It was a very high dollar, low volume um, company, uh, really kind of a limited number of salespeople, very, very smart, very, very seasoned salespeople. But we had to be very, very careful, government regulations, pricing, discounting, and things like that. So we overlaid Spring CM on that to make sure our approval process was, was intact. And then obviously we were incorporated into SAP and things like that on the back end. So really kind of soup to nuts. I call it, you know, top end of the funnel, um, middle end, middle, which is really, I think, where I reside. Um, I call it grind. You know, you grind through the middle of the funnel in sales ops and then out the other side. So we really were, we, we didn't run skinny, but we ran very smart in the way we used our technology and technology stack. Makes sense. So kind of like an antidote to the proliferation of different the tools that are available to you, you, you managed to stay quite stoic and just focused on the ones that we're, that really we're approached with a lot of things on a daily basis. Yes. Got it. V very much so. Awesome. Um, and then as the, the virus hit in around March time, I assume you pushed the majority of the sales operation remote. Um, how did the team and you adapt and what were the biggest challenges around that? That um, exact date, we moved remote in March 11th. Now, um, as far as the changes we've made, a lot of our groups were, were remote to begin with. I think that, and I'll get back to collaboration amongst you know, multiple, multiple disciplines and multiple teams. I think the biggest challenge and the biggest change was maintaining that cadence 
with legal and with finance and with marketing, just to make sure there's there the touch points were all adhered to, and you had a very good cadence for what you were doing, and you didn't get lost. Uh, you'll find that, and I mentioned that uh, most of our sales team was very seasoned. They didn't need a lot of guidance, but we needed to make sure, and the ops position or in my ops role, that we were following the process, including you know a forecasting process, a compensation process. Uh, we, we focused a lot on making sure that collaboration tools were in sync and that everyone was using the same thing and even relayed back to some government entities. You can't use certain collaboration tools with them. But really, from an enterprise software perspective, it was less about holding um, the sales team together. You know, certainly we hold them to their numbers and hold them to the cadence of their of their pipeline, and more about just keep making sure that the internal process something didn't get lost that allowed for a gl- you know allowed for a glitch or allowed for kind of a, a chink in our armor and the way we did things. Sure, that that makes total sense. So, if the majority of the reps were were fine, how about well, my, my other question is yes, we, we had the reps. But your internal sales operations team, did they also adapt the set? Like, how did you change the way you worked with direct reports? Um, direct reports were, it was very much held to a very high sync in our, uh, in our cadence of reporting. In other words, on a daily basis, it was, you know, what are you doing? What are you going to be doing it? We made sure that they really use systems. Uh, we, we made sure that particularly in the contract, from a contracting perspective, we adhered to a um, very disciplined um, uh, very disciplined rules with with a, a deal approvals, with pipeline gates, with pipeline stages, because really what I think and, and the, the sales ops team, my direct team, you know, was a very small team. But it, sales ops at the end of the day is most about asset asset allocation and resource allocation, making sure that my team, the information that they internalized and took in, the things they were responsible for, working with finance, working with uh, customer success, working with services, making sure that there were touch points. I wasn't with them every day, but making sure that those touch points were followed up on to make sure the whole the whole sales ops system worked, you know, in its entirety or holistically. Sure. Now. The, the there must have been operational and cultural changes back in March when you guys went remote, right? Um, yes. Now I, I assume some people may be coming back into the office. Those changes you made are, are, are any of them going to stay? Like, let's say you started using a different tech tool to help, like record sales calls, for example, um, or or track communication between reps and prospects. Uh, will you be keeping those on, or uh, were these just temporary measures? It, it's funny you mentioned recording sec- uh, recording a uh, sales calls for a. Um, oh, there's something we've looked into, and it's something we may keep actually. Recording sales calls, doing QA on sales calls in a remote environment, it's very very difficult. It's almost impossible for the VPs to be on all the calls with some of the AEs. So recording uh, sales calls, recording BDR calls, making sure that um, you know they're 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 passing along the correct message, particularly in the time of of COVID, that they're on target, that their that their sales calls are successful. That might be something that stays actually. Uh, everything else we and you mentioned collaboration platforms again. Yes, collabor- collaboration platforms have changed. We're now using a different collaboration platform so that we're synced with our a. Um, uh, we're actually a subsidiary of Software AG North America, so that we're synced with North America, and we're not using disparate platforms. Those two things, doing call recordings, doing QA, doing analytics on phone calls, they will probably stay. And it's actually something I'm looking into in my new role, because there really is a lot, a lot, I think, of a opportunity to do that, particularly with everyone working remote. Everything else, collaboration platforms, we, we all really found out very quickly what worked and what didn't work, what connectivity we had, and how much we really relied on being in the office every once in a while when you got in. And let's say from an ops perspective, um, I had choose a platform. I only had eight licenses and we had 15 people that needed it. We found that out very quickly. Let's take a look at all of the platforms that we have, all the technology that we have. Do we have enough to fulfill obligations? And that's one of the things that really kind of caught us as a blind spot. You know, we only have we we have a webinar with four or fifty people. Guess what? We only have twenty seats. Well, guess what? Let's go to the ops guys and make sure that everything we have, we understand in its entirety, and it's spreadsheeted somewhere, and it's held in a collaboration platform or in a um, 
a file of exactly how much you can use, who can use it, you know, and how can you, how would you consume it? So those things will stay. And that was actually a very good learning experience. And I do think though, that, um, you know, once again, getting back to the, the remote nature of enterprise sales, a lot of those things will stay and will help us in the long run. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Cool. And then moving on to the forecasting process, like I, I assume that that had to change at some point in, in March, <laughs> April. How did that change? And, and I know you've now left the business, but how, how did that evolve through the virus? Um, we are very good at forecasting. I, 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 I'm not going to pat myself on the back because that's not, not what I'm here to do, but I have always been, I'm a, I'm a, I'm not a quant guy. Like I said, I'm a tech pragmatist. Um, and getting back to kind of, you know, where, where do you need to be? What do the numbers need to be? Our numbers didn't change. You know, there was no relief from numbers as it should be. Our average sales cycle is, you know, 12 to 18 months. So we're more focused on business development and creating new pipeline than we were on the current stage or changing those numbers. But, but the forecasting to me has always been a very disciplined look at, you know, the higher level. How much coverage do you have? It's typical stuff, same stuff you'll hear from every, everyone else. If you're, if your number is a hundred million, do you have 300 million in qualified coverage, you know, in qualified pipeline to cover it? Ladder stage forecasting, you know, do you have, as it goes through the gates, as you've met with a gatekeeper, have you met with a holder of the budget, have you met with the decision makers, you know, as it gets to ladder stages in the, in the funnel, you know, quantitatively, you'll know that, you know, do you have 1.5 or two times coverage? Does that make sense? And then I think really, really, as it relates to COVID, as it relates to the way things changed, it was a much more judicious look at gates as it goes through the pipeline. Has this happened? Has this happened? Have, has this, have they gone through a demo? Do they have budget? I'm not saying we went straight for the Bant stuff and the Medic stuff, but it was in order for us to allocate resources, which were very scarce and very difficult to get on site, particularly with government agencies, we had to make sure that the deal was qualified enough. And that included not only forecast, you know, can we forecast this? Should it be in best case? But that included, you know, can we put people behind this? Can we allocate money slash assets resources to this? That will stick. And that's something we've long done but there was a much more adherence to that because it's obviously much more visible. You're looking at your screen and you really have to rely on what's in the system in order to make those decisions. Sure. Um, as that, as the virus hit and you were tightening up the forecast over that time period, hmm? what were the key metrics that, that you were looking at? Um, it was basically contracts that had been released uh, have they in the government and the government entity contracts that have been released? What's the what's the um, um, con what's the contract vehicle that they're going to use? Um, how long is you know how long has the pipeline been aging? Um, has it been? Uh, is it something that is a you know is it been technically val validated? Uh, we look at annual growth by business unit. In other words, you know, are we going to hit that? Are we applying marketing in the right place? Productivity by rep. We had to take a look at our reps and make sure that we knew who was going to be productive, who wasn't going to be productive over a period of time. Um, bookings, new pipeline generation, obviously. And then really average sale price and uh, funnel, funnel stage close to ratios. You know, we'll take a look at, you know, legitimately, you have to have a certain amount of coverage. You have to have your reps performing and you have to not only have, you know, you have to have leading indicators in order to get you through a period like this. Sure. And are the business continuing? I know you just listed a load of metrics. Are, are the business continuing to track all of those as we're coming? A and, and more. Average deal size, ACV, cost per lead, cash, customer retention, things like that. The, the business is actually like a lot of other businesses has switched more from um, perpetual with maintenance 
to more of a subscription model. Um, probably a lot of software AG has been around for 50 years. And, you know, a lot of their products were, it's enterprise. It's an enterprise company. You're not going to go into Office Max and find software AG products. But we're, we're switching from, a, or they were switching very, very successfully, by the way, to a um, subscription model. And that, and that actually uh, led them to, we needed to know what the, you know, average, the annual contract values were. We didn't know what the cost of customer retention was. We know, are we going to, are they going to hire customer success managers? It was really kind of new to them. So same old sales metrics, but certainly, you know, in maintaining and managing your, your market valuation, um, your cash flow, your revenue. It's a little tricky when you're doing subscription versus perpetual. All those things and more are being managed and actually very well managed by the team out of uh, Herndon, Virginia, not of a, um, out of Germany. And which, like, out of all those, which was most helpful for you during the virus or most insightful? <laughs> uh, I would say we, we would tend to focus, uh, we do quarter plus one, uh, and that generally is, you know, current quarter, making sure that the latter stage opportunities are qualified. Uh, once again, it's not a, it's not a um, medic or bant or having them update that on a daily basis. I am not a huge believer in administrivia. I'm a huge believer in, you know, practical application of, you know, people, processes, and technologies. But it really was, as we would go through these deals, and let's say we closed X deals per quarter, making sure that all of these marks, these boxes have been, have been ticked. And uh, we were really under a high level of scrutiny by upper management and, and frankly, passed with flying colors. The other, the other metrics, annual contract value, pipeline generation, um, bookings, customer retention costs, certainly that comes, that comes with all of this. But the most important thing to get us through this was focusing on the near term and making sure that you know, our deals, including the majority of our high value forecastable or you know, best case upside deals closed. Sure. Uh, moving on to the final stages now, um, who has inspired you? inspire you the most in your career james uh in my career my dad in in my sales ops career i have been extremely lucky to have come in contact with at least can i do more than one yeah i'll be quick um steve biondi who actually worked for ibm and i think he holds some of the ops patents at ibm he's currently the um channel manager for lenovo he was the one that taught me to focus on what's important. Start with the end and figure it out from there. Also, um, Mike Lee, who I worked with relatively recently, was very good. He's very crisp. He's very clear on the fact that, you know, you need to, once again, focus on what's important. This is what you're looking at, and this is what your role is. Don't get involved in the clutter. Don't introduce administrivia. Make sure that you're getting by and making sure that you're getting quick wins and things like that. And then I used to work for um, ASG Technologies, Art Allen. Um, from the day I started working there, was maniacal on quantitative analysis and making sure that you know he wasn't blindsided. So I've, I've always learned from him to make sure that you do your homework before you before you go into anything, really. You need to be able to, at a managerial level, at a CFO level, at a sales management level, and at a rep level, anticipate what their needs are and bring to them what they need. And that includes, you know, data information that will help them, for, you know, in a forward-looking manner. So the three of them and my dad. So, yeah, so uh, Steve, Mike, and Art. And should we give your dad a shout-out by name as well? Gary. Awesome. Um, yes. And then final question, I, I know you've now transitioned out and you're helping a few clients with sales ops as a consultant. Um, what is your focus there and where can any listeners find out more about that? Um, the name of my company is Terry Performance Company. It's T-E-R-E, -E, Performance Consulting. Terry is, and I've already given it a shout out, Terry means grind in Latin. It's uh, everything in the middle. The glory is the top of the funnel. The, um, you know, you're getting glory at the bottom. In the middle, it's all grind. It's all process. It's people, systems, process. It's comp plans. It's forecasting. I do evaluations of sales operations, uh, recommendations about, um, you know, what you can do, what you should do, what you can do to improve it based upon, you know, certain benchmarks that I see. And then I can either help with implementation 
or not help, or I can certainly do ongoing management of uh, a person's sales operations um, process. And really, my my goal is in working with partners or working directly with customers is to provide a world-class sales operations organization. And the website is terepc.com. So it's T-E-R-E-P-C.com. And it's fun. It's really something that I've looked forward to for a while and just started. That's the most important part, right, James? It's fun. Yes. Yes. Um, Amazing. James, thank you for that kind of very detailed look at how your previous uh, company migrated uh, through the crisis, through remote work, through the tech stack, through processes. So thank you so much for that. And I do urge anybody who um, needs help with the middle of the funnel, the grind, um, to check out James and his site. So James, thank you so much for coming on. Tom, my pleasure. Thank you.